Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Across the Sky podcast, Elite Enterprises podcast. We appreciate you listening, whether it's on your favorite podcast platform or on your favorite local news website. We are talking about the phone companies and weather. Believe it or not, phone companies hire meteorologists, and we thought there would be no better person to talk to than Mark Elliott, who is the principal meteorologist for AT&T, of course, one of the country's biggest phone companies here he's also been on the weather channel for nearly 20 years you can still see him there on occasion and join with me to interview him we have matt holliner in the midwest and sean sublet down in richmond virginia kirsten lang is out for today guys how's it going going pretty good yeah i really enjoyed this interview because i got to reconnect with mark a little bit way i actually got a chance to work with him in my uh, brief summer internship at the Weather Channel in the summer of 2013. And uh, he was typically in the afternoons. I was most often in the mornings, but I got to work all this year, so I did get a chance to work with him there. It was good talking about the experience of being at the Weather Channel because it is just an amazing place if you're a meteorologist to work at. But also hearing why he made the shift from being at, some would call it a dream job at the Weather Channel to working for AT&T and the, the change that came with that. It was a really interesting conversation. Yeah, I like that as well. The the things that he learned at the Weather Channel, how he was able to apply those and his new job and the, the rationale for, for making the jump and just trying to understand, well, why does AT&T need a meteorologist? And once you stop to think about all the hardware that's scattered all about the country and it's outside, then it all begins to add up. But uh, yeah, so he has a lot of interesting things to say uh, about that. So it's a good, good episode. Yeah, good episode. We're excited to show you here. So let's dive into it. You're listening to Mark Elliott on the Across the Sky podcast. How powerful is the Cox Network? So powerful that one day, the internet will let your doctor perform miracles from thousands of miles away. Connecting to remote operating room. Giving a whole new meaning to the term house call. Operation complete. The Cox Network, with gig speeds everywhere. It's internet built for tomorrow, today. Cox, bringing us closer. In Cox serviceable areas, speeds vary and are not guaranteed. Cox terms apply. Other restrictions may apply. We are here with our special guest for today on the Across the Sky podcast, Mark Elliott, Principal Meteorologist at at and which we're going to talk plenty about. You may know him from the Weather Channel, where he has spent nearly 20 years in front of the camera talking to audiences all across the country. He's still doing some freelance work now. Uh, he is a graduate of Rutgers University, which I might just say is the best university on the planet, but we'll let other people decide that one. Uh, he got his Master's of Science at uh, Georgia Institute of Technology, also known as Georgia Tech. Mark, thanks for coming on the podcast. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for the invite, guys. Yeah, no, absolutely. We're, we're looking forward to diving into everything. But I do want to ask this because I, th and I'm even thinking about this as, you know, if I put my non-weather hat on, you know, why would AT&T need a meteorologist? What are you doing there that, that is, and I know it's important work, but can you explain what's going on? Where did the motive to have a meteorologist at AT&T come from? Yeah, and you know, even stepping back from that, like not necessarily anything specific to my current job at AT and T, corporate meteorology is this a growing, exploding part of the of the field that these these companies are realizing that it is a strategic advantage, it's a monetary advantage to have forecasters, to have meteorologists with experience that can talk about these complicated patterns, complicated science and put it onto the company level, talking about how weather will directly affect them. It's slightly different from what you'd get from a, you know, the National Weather Service or from a National Weather Channel. It's more, you know, those places, while they have access to where the weather will be, don't necessarily have the same access to the company's internal data of where their stuff is, what's there, what's important, how are each one of those assets affected by the weather. And once you start thinking about it that way, it makes a lot of sense for companies big and small to have some sort of weather connector, weather service of some kind that is giving them information. And AT&T recognized that as well. How many people work? You know, are you the only meteorologist there? Do you have a team? How, how does that work? 
we're a small but mighty team. It's <laughs> not. I'm not the only one, but uh, it's one hand or less that is uh, <laughs> making up uh, the AT and T forecasters. And and so you know we do a lot. We do a lot of work with, with with just a small number of people. We're talking about United States, Mexico, areas around the world where there might be, you know, data connections under the ocean. Yeah, it's a it's a global it's a global reach for as you can imagine for a company with that name. Yeah, for sure, Mark. Um, one of the things, and, and again, I don't want you to give away any kind of secrets or anything like that, because I think in our own minds we can understand. Okay, well, uh, anything from from space weather, of course, affects communications as well as well as heavy precipitation uh, or any other kind of thing that affects telecommunications. That's kind of where my mind is. And as yep. you alluded to. Um, this is becoming a growing field. We already know that this has happened a lot in the financial industry and in the energy industry over the last 10 to 20 years in particular, using use that information to, to leverage your position against, against your competition. Um, what other kinds of things, without you giving away too much, how does the weather affect a company like AT&T or any telecommunications company uh, over what I, I kind of mentioned? Yeah, uh, and and you're right. Uh, you're right, and more right. Ev almost every type of extreme weather could have an extreme impact, and so it's our job to basically forecast the risk. It's not necessarily a weather forecast; it's a risk forecast. And then we have other teams that go out there, and they are trying to take that information and mitigate or minimize that risk as much as possible. So. You know, first things first, it's about for these companies, companies big and small that have corporate meteorology, it's about protecting the people, right? You want to make sure your people know what they're getting into day by day. So first on the list is people. Second is probably places, the assets that are fixed and are out there, whether those are buildings, whether those are communication towers in my, in my case, any type of weather that could affect something sticking up into the air, whether that's a building or a tower or anything else. And obviously you can you don't need me to tell you what that might be, you know, lightning, tornadoes, extreme wind, uh, flooding, all really important to those fixed assets. And then there's mobile assets, things that are moving around, whether it's company fleets, they need to know what they might be driving into. It's um, it's really far and wide. I, I would say I think a lot of corporate meteorologists and at t included, we focus a lot on tropics because they are such big players when they come into an area, but also wind in general, strong wind can have an outsized influence. Tornadoes, while really important, as we know, are really small scale. And so they often can be really troublesome and problematic and destructive in those local areas. But for a national scale, they might not be as important, right? It's it's all about perspective and and what that individual company needs at the time. And Mark, I'm curious about the lightning because I would imagine the most common thing that you might have to deal with are just general thunderstorms, not necessarily severe thunderstorms, but just regular thunderstorms that have lightning and all those cell phone towers. So what goes into the forecast and are there any special preparations to try and protect those towers ahead of time? I and mean, what happens when those towers inevitably do get struck by lightning? Just like how how do you handle the lightning situation with all these cell phone towers sticking way up in the sky, certainly attracting some lightning? Right. They're big, tall, pointy objects. And it's what we've always said, like, don't be the tallest object out in the field. And yet that's what towers are. That's what our buildings are. Um, and so we use the same technology that any all building would have there is lightning um you know mitigation on top of these tall pointy objects just like the empire state building is struck multiple times a year and yet the building is still there a lot of these towers have lightning rods of some kind in order to ground them so that the charge can flow through and not destroy everything but there's also always all kinds of alerts that go off if if, if things go wrong and so then the tech teams can go back out there and and figure out what went wrong and fix it up. So it, this sounds to me this is like a is this like a twenty four seven kind of job where you guys are always you know looking out for what's happening across I, I'm assuming the whole country right. And the weather doesn't really stop right for and nights true. and weekends and holidays and you know what you're getting into when you sign into this field. We are not really staffed twenty four seven. 
but we're also not not staffed either. I mean, when it's a big event, we're we're going to be up watching it anyway, so we might as well be helping the company through it, kind of thing. You know, us meteorologists, we get not not excited, but like we study this. We want to see what's happening when when big weather happens, and so if we're going to be up watching it we're going to be forecasting for it kind of thing. If people in the, in the business are interested enough in it, you better believe the meteorologists in the business are interested in it too. But what I will say is that a lot of our work happens very early. I'm not a morning person by nature. I don't know if you can see it in my eyes or hear it in my voice, but we start roughly 5 a.m. every day in order to get the bulk of our forecasting work and risk analysis done before other decision makers get up and start making their plans because the weather affects those plans. And so my busiest time of the day is often that 5 to 8 a.m. Eastern time frame. And yet the company doesn't work on those hours. And so there will still be meetings and special projects and all kinds of stuff for someone on the West Coast after their lunchtime. And next thing you know, it you've worked 12 hours. You know, it's it, it's not a job that has fixed, fixed nine to fives. It's not an easy role to, 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 to slide into if you're if that's the goal. So let me jump in next. We talk about those short term threats, right? You know, whether it's a, a winter storm, ice, snow, wind, you know, lightning, tornadoes, hurricanes, flooding, all that stuff. But are you kind of evolving also into a longer term climate risk? Like, hey, we've got these assets on the coastline or near the coastline. Are we worried about those for 10, 15, 20 years? Are you doing kind of this longer term climate risk also? As a company, yes. As me, not as much. I'm involved in some of those discussions, but there's an entire other team that is looking at long-term climate risk. In fact, there's some great partnerships with AT&T and Argonne National Labs putting out publicly available climate risk down to the location. So, you you know, it's called Clim- Climar, Climar, C-L-I-M-R-R, and it's, it's publicly available. It's from AT&T Labs, basically, AT&T's innovators and the Argonne National Laboratory. And you can put in uh, an address. If you have a building, if you have your home and, and you want to know what the climate risk may be there uh, for that location in the years to come, we've made it available because we think that should be a public good as at and made that, made that choice to put that out there for everybody. And then, of course, we use that data both in short and long-term ways. We can use it in the short term to be kind of an extra data point if we're looking at flooding like will this cause flooding to our assets well we can take one more piece of data like you know you have the ero from the weather prediction center you might have the the you know the flood risk from fema as part of your decision making but maybe you also bring in the argon national laboratory and it's saying you know in 50 years there's pretty much no risk here because of local elevation or because of, you know, small scale changes that might be even more fine tuned than your FEMA data that can help us lower or raise even a current day's forecast of risk at a location. So, you know, we're, we're using it. And then of course, for long-term site picking, if you had a choice of putting a, a new building here or here, and one of them is saying, oh, this is going to be underwater in 20 years. And one is saying it's not that's an added piece of data that you can start to use. You know, the, the, the data part of this is really important in the long run. So Mark, besides the early mornings and the occasional long hours, what would you say is the most challenging part of your job? Oh, challenging part. I mean, I didn't do a lot of uh, international forecasting at the Weather Channel, right? It was very much US-based, trying to figure out the right way to communicate risk in Mexico was a challenge for me because I'm not a Spanish speaker. Um, the, there's also, you know, if, if you're doing forecasts internationally, you don't have the same kind of available data that you would be used to using if you were looking at a front approaching the U.S. or coming through the U.S. Watching typhoons in the West Pacific is was not really in my day-to-day, and now it is. So there's, it, uh, that was, I, I'd argue, interesting and a new challenge because of it. 
And is there any part of the world that AT&T is not concerned about? Or do you literally have to look across the whole globe? Or is there some area that you can say, you know what, we can skip that part of the, of the, of the forecast? It's different. Uh, we, we care about it differently. I'm not spending a lot of time in, say, Central Europe, but we know those patterns influence what happens downstream and eventually it comes to us anyway. So if you're not at least paying attention to where there's big pattern changes or, you know, really life-threatening weather, communication is life-saving. And so if we have the ability to help a community because of destructive weather, at and is probably going to be there in some way. And once our people are there, we're forecasting spot forecasts for wherever they are. So if the weather gets bad enough and our people are going to help, whether it's reestablished communication or whatever the case may be, we're also involved so that while they're there, they're getting spot forecasts from us. Awesome. Well, we're going to take a brief break here and we'll come back on the other side with more from Mark Elliott on the Across the Sky podcast. Get great fall savings on all your home care and entertaining needs during the fall home care event at Safeway. Head into Safeway and get deals on products like Clorox disinfecting wipes, Swiffer wet mopping cloths, Lysol all-purpose cleaner, Swiffer wet jet mopping pads, Mr. Clean multi-surface cleaner, or Lysol power toilet bowl cleaner. Visit Safeway.com or head into your local store for more details. Offers expire October 31st. Restriction supply promotions may vary. And we are back with the Across the Sky podcast hosted by the Lee Enterprises weather team. I'm here with Matt Holliner and Sean Sublick. Kirsten Lang could not be with us today. Mark Elliott is with us here. He is our guest for today. Uh, Principal meteorologist at AT AT&T and longtime meteorologist at the Weather Channel. And we'll dive into this a little bit. So, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, I I think you started at the Weather Channel right after Rutgers. Is that true? It is uh, it, it pretty rare. That's what I was going to get into because, like, from my perspective as a meteorologist, like, the Weather Channel's, like, the top, right? And, you know, I, I just, it always feels like something you, you know, you work towards for a while and you get that moment. I mean, it's great you started there right off the bat, but I have to ask, how did you do it? Yeah, so that, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a combination of really hard work and a little bit of luck. I mean, let's face it, it requires a little bit of both. Yeah. I will credit Rutgers. As you should. Go, go ahead, Joe. Jump yeah. in there. All right, we got an R. We got an R. You. Oh, you. Yeah. Yeah. I will credit Rutgers and Rutgers Meteorology for for really giving me the opportunity to be able to be seen by the Weather Channel. So here's how this went in kind of a short form version. So at, at Rutgers, um, and I guess... Before and after, I was a bit of an overachiever. I did the double major program at Rutgers, which meant that my electives were things like organic chemistry, you know, for fun. I'll tell you why. You know as well as I, Mark, organic chemistry at Rutgers is not an easy class. I know a lot of people who took it and did not do so well on the first go around on that. So that's a toughie at Rutgers. Non-A grades at Rutgers. Um, I mean, it wasn't too far down, but you know, achiever. So, you know, I had a, a, a huge GPA. I had two different majors and I did all of these internships while at Rutgers at Rutgers sanctioned and helped organize. So I would had a, I had a TV internship at news 12, New Jersey. I had a national weather service internship at Mount Holly at the New Jersey office. I was doing research within, or at least you know, data collection and analysis. I don't know if I'd really call it research looking back on it, but for the Rutgers PAM site, so the photochemical assessment monitoring. So I was getting into, you know, field work and and figuring out what these, what the, what the, what the big profilers did and what they meant and all this. And that was all through Rutgers. And at the same time, the Rutgers meteorology club and my, you know, kind of my year and right around my year uh, of, of being there were the first ones to really organize and start sending student groups to the American Meteorological Society conferences and the student conference in particular. So I saw a table at a conference for the Weather Channel for student internships, and I gave them my resume, which also had Rutgers 
you know, our, uh, Weather Watcher, right? The RU yep. Weather Watcher program, which yep. is TV meteorology. It yep. had a radio experience from WRSU because yep. I worked uh, on there and was doing their news team weather reports occasionally. So I had all this stuff on the on the resume and I handed it into a summer internship thinking like, oh my gosh, uh, this is going to be so amazing. And I didn't even hear a no, right? I didn't get it. Yeah. I didn't get it. And I didn't get a yes, something. much less a no, a no, much less a yes. I heard nothing. And I'm like, well, you know, I got nothing. And I'm about to graduate senior year. And I am internally and rather externally, I think, also panicking. Uh, my friends were signing up for grad schools. They knew what they wanted to research. They were getting job offers. They were moving. And I was just applying to job after job after job and not even hearing no, still nothing. And I, I applied to National Weather Service Puerto Rico. I was like, I'll learn <laughs> Spanish. You know, like they, that's not what they wanted, right? But like I was applying to anywhere because I liked all things weather. I didn't, I didn't have a focus. I didn't like, I think that actually hurt me a little bit. I wasn't like, I'm only looking at tropical things. I'm going to go to grad school for tropical meteorology and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to work at CSU and do, you know, long range forecasting. Like there wasn't a goal like that because I just wanted to be in the field. I just wanted to do something weather. So I was about to graduate and my in-room dorm phone rang uh, and my roommate answered thinking it was a joke or a prank or whatever uh, because somebody called at saying they were from the weather channel. And once he realized it was real, he changed his tone a bit and got me the phone and it was for a because i had rutgers radio the wrsu experience on my resume they um it floated around the building for i think about a year and a half and somebody was going on maternity leave and they said do you want this job it starts in august there is no moving expenses there is no help finding a place to live it goes from august to november it is through four days a week max it is 35 hours a week max there is no benefits you cannot work at the month of december or else it triggers you to be full-time and you're not allowed to be so it's literally this and do you want it and i said yes i do and so i went to the weather channel for a part-time job in radio and stayed 18 years is the long and short of it wow that that that's incredible i mean on a lot of fronts there i mean because even still i mean even with the you know wrsu which is great it's just i feel like you know th to get it as i'm sure a wide pool of applicants it's a big testament to your skills and everything you've done and obviously you made a very long career out of it being there for 20 years and even still freelancing there now what's it like working there i've never been there i know where it is but i've never been there like it like when you're there does it, it kind of does it just feel like special? Because, you know, for for the people who are listening, like, you know, for a lot of us meteorologists, you grew up watching the Weather Channel because you didn't really know anybody who was interested in weather growing up. That was the same for me. I knew nobody that was going to be a meteorologist in their career until I went to Rutgers. So when you get there, you know, is it just like, wow, like I, like I made it? Like, is that how it feels? Is that in many ways, like you always get, at least I always did, I always got that thrill putting on the blue jacket right like yeah. there was something yeah. about like i didn't care what time it was when i went into the field you put on that blue coat and you're walking down the hallway of a hotel with no power and you're like you got to strut right like you got yeah. a different feel about it because you know everyone knows that brand it's one of the most well yeah. and well respected brand it wins the most respected news brand year after year after year after year but away from that, like in the building, it is very mission driven. The people you see on air are on air because they have mission and purpose and they're trying to communicate this science and keep people safe. Like they 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 look at it and I looked at it as, you know, someone listening right now, we could save their life. If we give them the right info, if we give them the right information that they can use and 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 react to the right way or not do the wrong thing, which I think is often more, more often the case. So that mission and, and purpose was very apparent. Like people knew why we were there. And then you're surrounded in a room of other meteorologists like you. So, you know, how, where else can you go where you, you know, you have a severe weather question and you can go up to Dr. Forbes, 
or you have a, a hurricane that's coming up and you can go to a director of the National Hurricane Center. You could just be like, Rick, first name, right? Uh, Forget Dr. Nab. Rick. No. Yeah. They're like, Dr. Nab, tell me what's up. What's with this question? Like, that's awesome. Having that kind of knowledge base. And then you have the people that we all know that have been there since we've all been watching, right? Since it started in the early 80s, more or less. And you're, you're, you can have a question for Jim about broadcast or Mike Seidel about, you know, field work or, you know, Kelly Cass, name the broadcaster who they've, the, the longevity of the people there and the, uh, the skill that comes from that is really impressive. And so you're just a sponge. You're soaking up so much weather knowledge, communication knowledge, weather communication knowledge, which is its own little, uh, you know, microcosm of interesting. And it's not just meteorologists, right? You have producers and directors and news gatherers and like they're all the best of the best in that room putting a show together and you're a part of that team. And so you're learning how that works and you're learning how it goes and you're, you know, you're the expert because it's, it's not just, you know, the, the, the news channel, it's the weather channel. And so your knowledge is important and they, they value it. So it's, it was really a special place and it was not something I didn't enjoy anymore. Right. So like that wasn't the motivation for leaving there. It was, it's, uh, I, you know, I still go back, right? Th that says something. How many people leave their job and still go to hang out because it's still fun for them? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, I understand. I, let me ask you this too, like, you know, that I do feel like a number of people who are, you know, working on the Weather Channel, they might start in local news and then work their way up to the Weather Channel. Did you feel like you missed out maybe by not taking, you know, working in that local news setting and going right to national? Or is it something that, you know, hey, I'm at the Weather Channel. I love it here. I'm here. A little of both, maybe. I feel like it will it would be difficult for me to have left the Weather Channel and gone to local because there have been many who have done that. And so I don't I might not know enough to be able to speak to it. Right. Because I. I wasn't in that world long. I, you know, an internship at, uh, in a, is not the same as being a chief meteorologist at a local, at a local spot, but I was used to following the weather and my ship changing no matter where the weather was that day. So like I would go where the weather could kill you. I would jump around to the middle of the night. I would be in the evenings because there was lots of severe weather. I'd occasionally move to the afternoons and then back to the overnight. Like, I would follow the weather. You don't really do that in local. You've got your set time frame. The weather might be boring for a long stretch in mm -hmm. one location. Whereas if you're looking nationally, there's always a weather story somewhere. And so for me, it was always like, man, if I had to just look at one market, what would that feel like after looking at a national scale uh, for as long as I did? You guys can tell me I'm wrong and be like local a <laughs> best and it's super interesting and we get to do the school talks and we get to be part of the community and I would find all the things that I would love about that but it's very different from looking at a national scale and talking about where the big story is only well I'll say as somebody who literally just came from a school visit to talk to you right now Mark uh it, it, it's always good to be a part of the community and and I do like it that way but I mean hey listen again when you're at the weather channel I mean you made it. I mean, you're there. So I know Matt, you had a question. So God, I don't want to take too much time. Yeah, I, no, like I'm not. I'm not putting down local by any stretch. I think I would not. love being in a community that way and being really focused and and and, and that kind of thing. Uh, but your original question was like, do I feel like I missed out on not starting in that route? And I think I just, I, I, you know, I I did some of those local feel type things at the national network. Right, I came in through radio. And so I was on local radio stations, some of them live and part, you know, people that were listening didn't know I wasn't in their sound booth with their board, radio board in front of me, right? We, we tapped into it virtually and digitally, but I was kind of part of those local communities. And then we, you know, again, I'm dating myself a little bit, but video on the internet was a new thing. And so I was doing local forecasts on your local on the eighth page i think they actually called it that <laughs> how weird is that uh thinking back on the like the 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 days of weather.com uh in like the early 2000s or so where 
kind of mid 2000s probably when video was coming out on weather.com but your local page had a video of just the new york city forecast that was new and so that was me right yeah. they didn't have the the full on air people doing that shift all the time because they had their full on air shift to do so i would be jumping in and that's so i got some of that some of that like trial by fire local tv and local feel experience at the national network which is different but pretty cool to be able to say i did it that way yeah, Mark, I know exactly what you're talking about, because when I was interning at the Weather Channel, I mean, at the time, it was really cool to me, but I got to do some of those local web forecasts. They let me do it near the end of my internship. I had to do a few sample videos for it to make sure I was I was good enough. And boy, when I when my first thing showed up on Weather.com, it was just amazing. As somebody who was in college to be on Weather.com, it was fantastic. It was certainly not the same as being on the actual Weather Channel, but being on the website was pretty cool. And I felt the exact same way about being at the Weather Channel, being in that building, and just the knowledge, the immense knowledge of the TV business, but also the forecasting business, the meteorology, be around all those other meteorologists. It was a fantastic place to work. So my question for you is, when was the moment that you realized you need to make a change? What caused you to make the shift from being at the Weather Channel, for some people, their dream job, to then switching to a very different role at at and I don't know if I did realize it just kind of happened. A lot of it was on a whim. So the the real answer is I was I was doing my CCM certification, the certified consulting meteorologist through the uh, AMS. And I had a you know a mentor who was encouraging me to do that project. I was doing it on my off time. It was COVID time, and so, Shifts were really strange at the Weather Channel. Times were moving around. Some people were working from home. Um, I was working in the studio, but more often than not, only at the times of extreme severe weather, right? Dr. Forbes had stepped away, mostly retired. And I was certainly not taking that role as the severe weather expert, but I was on the expert staff at that point and often being told to uh, follow where the severe weather would go. But there isn't severe weather every day. So I was using some of that time to really think about what was what else was out there and what else was happening. And I was like, I, I think basically I'm a consultant. I come in now and I talk about just the most extreme weather and I have to be able to make that digestible, but I have like, you have to be able to communicate differently. And it's, you're doing some post analysis reporting and a lot of things that a consultant would be asked to do. So I'm like, okay, this is different. This is not just a broadcast seal anymore for me. I'm going to try for the consulting meteorologist seal, which the process was epic. Some will argue harder than getting the master's degree that I have to get the, it, I won't necessarily swear by that, but it was, it was a long process. It's doable and it's fulfilling and it's important. So if you're thinking about doing it, you should for people that are listening but it's not quick. And um, so really by answering one of the questions that comes in, in the written exam, if you will, I, was, I wound up on a wormhole on the AMS site and I stumbled into this job post for a tropical expert meteorologist that, ha that could do communication and, uh, and, and kind of briefing style communications that, um, you know, could help lead a team to some degree and, you know, focus on the big weather stories of the day. And I was like, can do that, can do that, can do that, can do that, can do that. Like, you ever see a job post and you're like, was this written about me? Like, and, and then like the kicker was, and it's in Atlanta where I was already living. And I was like, and I don't have to move for it. And so basically it was a thought experiment. And I was like, okay, well, what would it be like if I took it two decades broadcast resume and tried to make it, you know, sound like I was doing all these other things because I really was, but that's not what you're thinking about when you're doing broadcast meteorology. And there are so many skills that translate from broadcast meteorology to corporate meteorology and many other big data science or communication or PR type jobs. And so I basically said, okay, I'm going to now, let's see. Let's see. I'm going to use this next day. And instead of working on the on this or that um, on my off time, I'm going to redo my resume. It's time to refresh it anyway. What could, you know, I basically was like, this will be fun. 
like, what else could I do today? And I applied to this job and I got an interview and then I got, I wound up getting the job and then I had a really tough decision because I, again, I didn't dislike what I was doing and I didn't necessarily sit there and say, Poof, I need to find something else. I don't like this anymore. I'm not interested in this anymore. Or I'm not, I'm not learning more. I'm not making a difference here. It was none of those things. It was, you know, it was a shiny new toy. And I, you know, after a lot of reflection and with myself and my family and asking, you know, could this, could this be a better work-life balance for us? Could this be better for my young kids? Cause again, I was bouncing around. I didn't know what I was, where I was going to be, right. And I, I could be sent out quickly. I didn't know what shift I was going to be on. I would miss events with the family. It was hard to plan stuff. And we said, okay, maybe this will have a little bit more regularity to it. It's a corporate world after all. And you know, it, it is different in that way. And so I, I, I took the risk. And uh, so again, it wasn't like, I'm going to switch. It was like, I guess I'll switch. So hold on. <laughs> let me go puke in the corner. Cause yeah, it was, it was frightening. It was a big change. I'm still not used to being the new guy. I'm surrounded by people that have 20 to 60 years of experience within AT&T. And now I'm here like, I have a year and a half. <laughs> it's very different, but not necessarily in a bad way. No, I think you're right. A lot of those skills you do in broadcast do come back or or they're applicable in so many other areas. Communications of risk, of scientific principles. You take a very complex situation and you need to distill it into actionable information. One of the things that, that I've really admired about the Weather Channel is doing that. This is immersive mixed reality stuff uh, that they continue to do. And I know you had some involvement in, in some of those as well. Uh, yeah. Take me through uh, as much as you were involved in production and and, and actually recording the things, uh, because I know any of us who have done broadcast meteorology, you're used to standing in front of a green screen and looking at something off camera and, and getting your bearings. Kind of how how is that uh, in terms of doing IMR and producing and all that? How big is the team for that, for one thing? Yeah, that there's a lot of questions there. Um, and I guess I'll start with... Um... You know, I was doing some pieces there that were basically IMR before it was called that, right? So there's a whole series of what was Weather Wizards that started as, uh, you know, could we open up a kitchen cabinet and do some sort of experiment at home with kids or, you know, for yourself and learn about the weather through cooking it up in front of you. And so we did a whole series of those and basically started running out of good ideas. And that was a small team. I came up with a lot of them. We had one producer. She would come up with several of them as well. We'd script it out. We'd think about what kind of graphics might pop up next to us. But it was mostly filmed, handheld down in you know an experiment that you were doing. And we said, okay, what if the what if the wizardry was not because of dry ice anymore and food coloring? It was because graphics would show up in front of you in the real world. And so we started doing these outside weather wizards that the graphic would be part of the environment that you are in. Thunderstorms would happen next to you or you'd pan up and suddenly you'd be up in the cloud and you'd watch a raindrop change, you know, snow, sleet, rain kind of thing as it went back down and then landed back where I was uh, next to my shoe, stuff like that. And you know, that technology kept evolving and kept growing all the way up to what's now classic, I guess not classically, but now known as IMR, that immersive mixed reality, where the entire room around you more or less is a green screen and everything can be changed, whether it's the floor, the background, the walls, all of it. When it was a smaller thing, I was writing a lot of that, right? I was you know, we won Kelly awards for the, the safest room piece, which is basically walking through a house and almost like, what if I was mayhem today? And I just stood back and all this stuff would happen around me to the house, to the, you know, to the outside and, um, and show people where you really need to be and why. So that one won all kinds of awards and really kind of, I would argue cemented the Weather Channel on going down this graphically heavy path because it is. Oh, I remember it. It was really well done. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I wrote most of that with it, with a team, right? And really, the graphics guys on that who um, are still buddies of mine, like they did 
incredible stuff, like two by fours that would crash through a wall. And when I bent under a two by four that wasn't actually there, a shadow would go across, right? Like those little things that like really make an IMR feel like IMR. So now it's done mostly back inside, but like you've seen some of these things where walls of water come into an actual town and show you what that actual town could look like if storm surge happened or if a flash flood happened. You can't feel what that's like without that. You're like, you're not going to go there when that's happening. And so it's those graphical, you know, entries into that world that are really effective communication tools. Like nine feet of storm surge. Okay. Who cares? I mean, like that's not the right answer, but nine feet is suddenly above an actual building and you've seen that building and you know how high that is like that's a totally different communication thing so as those have got more and more elaborate and more and more people were doing them the teams got bigger and bigger and lots of graphic artists lots of writers i i only did a couple of those official imrs the whole staff was then brought in to do more of them because they were epic right and everyone wanted a chance to be able to be in that in that room and and you know they should have been and i'm glad i'm glad that we all were they're really great communication uh tools the i think stephanie abrams did one with wildfire like you're not going to be in a in a forest like to see what it's like when a wildfire goes you know a football field a second but we were able to show that with graphics and her standing there on the little silver disc uh like and then a lot of those ended with a climate story like how is this type of extreme weather changing as the as the world is changing are we getting more of these less of these is it you know is things happening faster or slower you can't show that in in without a graphic and so to have that graphic happen around you was really really epic um they're really cool pieces mark i want to ask you one more and then, and then we'll get you out of here because this is maybe i'm just curious about this myself but you know when we have hurricanes or snowstorms how do you guys determine who goes where how does that happen? Are you in the meeting for that? Who's deciding that? Is it a lot of discussion? Is it pretty easy? It is the war room. There's a war whole bunch of people. Yeah, there's from the very higher stuff, uh, people that are in charge of TV, uh, in charge of storytelling, to the people that are in charge of scheduling and you know VPs of talent, and then meteorologists are in the room, producers are in the room. I mean, it is it is a whole fleet of people, and you're. You know, the meteorologists have a say uh, as well, uh, even all the way down to like you're sent here and you're there and you're like, I think the storm is changing. I think we need to be mobile to be here. All of that is still like you're in constant communication. And the best part of being at a place like the Weather Channel for field work is that you have a building worth of people watching your back that, you know, you have people back there that are that are focused on safety. And if you ever said, like, I can't do this broadcast, I'm not safe here or for for security reasons, for weather reasons, for anything, it was never a question. It was always like, "Yep, we'll 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 do something from the studio. We're not doing it live." Um, it was never asked uh, why, or you or you were never pushed to do something where you said it, it's not safe here. Ah, interesting. I always love seeing the map where it shows everyone like your face and everybody's faces and where they are on the coast for a hurricane or snowstorm. I thought that was always really on the weather. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything else you'd like to add before we wrap it on up? I mean, this was great. We love hearing from you. I mean, I always think it's interesting when meteorologists talk about how they got started or what, what made them interested in weather. Yeah. And so many people I've talked to about this cite a tree falling. I know that is tied to my experience. I don't know if you guys have any of that in your kind of origin story, but I think if you're the right age kid, and something that seems permanent, like a giant tree, can fall in front of you or near you or or hit something you know that also should have felt permanent as a young kid. I think it does something to our brains. Like, I never looked back uh, after watching a tree fall for why I wanted to do weather. It was always my answer. What do you want, want to be when you grow up? And it was weatherman. And the second part of that is my, you know, there was a my, my dad was involved in national preparedness, emergency preparedness for the VA hospital system, which, you know, in recent times has turned into more like cybersecurity and, you know, terrorist act and stuff. But back in the early, eight, late 80s and early 90s, that almost exclusively meant 
where could weather disasters happen? And so he would be sent into areas that had weather problems, and I would watch the Weather Channel because there was a channel on that was talking about where my dad was. And so I just never stopped. I still haven't stopped. I still watch it as a viewer even when I'm not there every day. So yeah, I, I think that the origin story of trees falling or family connections are really important to, to young minds and how they get into the science of weather. Yeah, and you know, we, we should have asked that earlier, and I apologize. How'd you get into weather? It's, uh, you know, I say this all the time. I said it when I was at school earlier. It's, it's something that for a lot of people, you know at a young age, and, and you definitely are in that category. And it's hard to just fall into weather, I feel like. You know, I, I don't really see too many people who just fall into weather as a career. Well, I wasn't sure what I wanted to major in, and I took an Elements of Meteorology class, and I just kept going. It's usually not that. Elements of Meteorology because I had to fulfill my one science requirement, and I never looked back. Right. Or I always wanted to be a meteorologist. I, I, I just, I guess I should have followed that. People actually make careers of this. Ah. Uh, or uh, I am a meteorologist, and I've known since I was seven. Yeah. Yeah, that was me. I mean, really, one of the first things I ever remember in my life was about wanting to be a meteorologist. So anyway, Mark, we, we really appreciate the time. Really insightful. We got to hear about your at t career, your Weather Channel career, more about you. Yeah, so thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. And uh, we'll, we'll chat with you soon. Yeah, thanks for having me. Anytime. If you uh, come up with more questions, again, <laughs> I used to talk for a living. So I, I'll, I'll talk some more. We'll keep that in mind for sure. Something grand is coming to Nemecolon. Opening fall 2023, the Grand Lodge will surprise and delight with 56 stunning suites and five-star butler services. Indulge in libations at the Circle Bar and the Study before you savor the new and enchanting Fawn and Fable restaurant, where the best parts of a traditional steakhouse and a fairy tale castle create a magical dining experience. With fine dining, a spa, and over 100 adventure, golf, art, and wildlife experiences, whatever your imagination holds, Nemecolon has the key. Visit nemecolon.com for more information. Awesome interview with Mark Elliott. He has many stories, as you would if you uh, worked for the Weather Channel for 20 years and uh, working at the one of, if not the largest phone companies. I know I always see the commercials about, is it AT&T or Verizon or is it T-Mobile Sprint now? I'm not too sure. But point is, uh, his job is very important at AT&T. Like Sean said at the beginning, you know, equipment and tech all across the globe, it's a big job. And, uh, you know, I'm glad that he's enjoying it. So, Matt, what'd you think? Yeah, when you're working for a big international company like AT&T, what stood out to me was when he mentioned that one of the most challenging parts of his job is not just forecasting for the U.S. anymore, which he had plenty of experience with at the Weather Channel, but that's all the Weather Channel has to worry about is the U.S. But at AT&T, this is a global company, and they have assets across the globe and so they're going to be concerned about the weather happening all over the planet so a huge job I mean, in some ways his job almost got even bigger now he has to look the entire planet worth of weather that is just you know a huge responsibility on him but you you know that i think this is also i I've, I've, i always bring this up you know i think we need more meteorologists and i think we're seeing that i think companies are realizing the value that having a team of meteorologists working for them, especially these really big companies because they know specifically what they want and what weather information they need. I and mean, they can go to their meteorologist rather than having to contact the media or the National Weather Service. They have a team working on what they know is most important for them and where their assets are located and getting these really specific forecasts. So I think this is something that we're probably going to see more and more, especially starting, of course, with these really big companies, but maybe even more medium-sized companies actually thinking about getting some meteorologists because the weather has an impact on so many businesses. So I think uh, this isn't going to be an exception. These companies having their own meteorologists, I think we're going to see more and more of it. Yeah, I, I agree. This kind of comes under the umbrella of weather risk management. You know, the forecasting has gotten so much better in the last 20 years, but there is an overload of data, right? So you need a professional to go through the data that's important, distill the most critical information to, to your business, uh, and help those decision makers within a business manage risk, uh, be sure your resources and your hardware are, are safe. And that's not something you can get. And I love my brothers and sisters in broadcast meteorology, but you're not going to get what you need in a two and a half or three minute weather forecast if you've got a lot of assets that need protecting. 
So I think that uh, there's a lot of growth in there and the whole weather risk and ultimately climate risk management as well. So it was really nice to hear Mark talk about that as well as share some of those weather channel stories. Thanks again, Mark. We appreciate it. Always good to have another Rutgers guy on the podcast too, if I may end. All right. So we have a full slate of podcasts coming up for you on the following Mondays. Sean, do you mind if I turn it over to you to talk about next Monday's episode with Mike Mann? Yeah, so uh, a very special episode we've got. We're going to record next week, drop it a couple week, um, a week or so after that. Uh, Mike Mann, uh, world-famous climate scientist. He has written several books. The most recent one is called Our Fragile Moment. I had a chance to, to preview it a couple of weeks ago. It's an exceptional book. Uh, if you've always wondered, how do scientists know what the, what the climate was like 1,000, 100,000, 10 million years ago? He walks through all of that in a very nice, uh, easy to digest book. So we're going to talk to him about that book uh, and what else he's working on in the podcast next week. So very excited to have Mike Mann on. Yeah, we're happy to have him on. And then on the 23rd, we're going to have Paul James from HGTV fame here to talk about the science of changing leaves. And I think we're going to have a winter forecast for you on the 30th of October as well. Uh, November 6th, we're going to have uh, someone talk about tips to prepare older loved ones for extreme weather. That's with Dr. Lauren Sutherland from Ohio State. And then we got another big one. You know, oh, Sean man. keeps landing all these big podcast guests for us. Sean's so really this, the MVP. This is, this is the first time I've said this publicly. So I think most people who are into science have heard of Neil deGrasse Tyson. The uh, his, He likes to say, your personal astrophysicist. He's got his podcast. He's got the Star Talk thing. He's got Cosmos. He's all over the place. He's going on a, on a book tour. He's going to be down here in Richmond. And I have scored a 15-minute interview with him. It's it's going to be a little ways away. I'm going to do it in November. But we will turn that into a podcast as well. So I am uber excited about that one. We're over the moon. I am over the moon and the stars excited to talk to him. I only have 15 minutes, so I got to make it count. If he's going to talk for 15 minutes, I'm sure we'll have plenty of commentary and plenty to digest from that 15 minutes because he is fantastic to listen to. Yeah, and I, I went through his new book when I, I think y'all knew I went to Italy. I read his new book on the flight over and back to Italy. Uh, and I will tell you all this because you're meteorologist. First chapter of his new book talks all about the lowest, uh, the lowest um, layers of the atmosphere. So he talks all about the atmosphere first. The book's called To Infinity and Beyond. So it basically starts with the ground and works up. So of course, you've got to start in the atmosphere before you get to outer space. So we talked about that, which I thought was just terrific. So yeah, that, uh, it's a couple, yeah, three, four weeks away. So uh, yeah, I'm yeah. excited. Yeah, Appreciate that'll it. be our November 13th episode right now. Yes. So you can circle your calendar for that one. And of course, all the other ones we have coming out on Mondays too. So for Sean Sublett, Matt Hollander, and Kirsten Lang, I'm meteorologist Joe Martucci. Thanks again for listening to the Across the Sky podcast. We'll be back with you next Monday.